Coming up next on All About Android, we rename the show to All About Pixels. It's me, Ron Richards, and our guest Duncan Jaffrey from Ozdroid, and we have a few surprises up our sleeves that we can talk about, sort of. We talk all about the Pixel 6, the Pixel 6 Pro, everything that was announced at the event. We show off the hardware. It's all Pixel, all episode long, except for emails. You get a little bit of break there. That's coming up next on All About Pixel. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. Delve into your next title on Audible with Audible Plus. New members can try Audible Plus for 30 days. Download the Audible app and get started with a free trial at audible.com slash allaboutandroid or text allaboutandroid to 500-500. Hello and welcome to All About Android. This is episode 547, recorded on Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. Your weekly source the latest news on the Pixel hardware, the Pixel hardware, and apps that you're probably going to find on the new Pixel 6 for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards. And this week, we're renaming the show All About Pixel. It kind so, of is that it's way the, this it's week. It's the new a- AAP. Uh, a- a- but hey. Double AP. <laughs> <laughs> Double AP, because listen, earlier today was uh, the big Google Pixel event. So, of course, we're going to be covering it and dissecting it and giving you everything you, need, everything you need to know and things you need to care about and uh, criticisms and things like that about today's event. I'm super excited, Jason. I can't wait. So. Me too. We got a lot of reason to be excited. And, you know, there are some people who are going to hear that intro and be like, oh, they already talk about Pixel all the time. And I don't, I don't want to watch it. Like, I don't care about the Pixel. And I get it. I understand. Like, there's there's probably some people out there who don't care as much about the pixels, but this is coming from the Google, direct from the source, direct from the vein. So, at least in my opinion, that makes it pretty important to cover closely. So, and and also, also, we should thank Google for timing it with the show. I mean, Google's yeah. been, as you'll find out in a few moments, Google has been extremely cooperative with us throughout they this have. pixel event. And totally. so we just, we want to thank Google PR. We want to thank Sundar. We want to thank Rogostola. We want to thank everybody involved uh, to for the timing of the event happening early on a Tuesday so that we can be here Tuesday night as opposed to happening on a Wednesday where we go, oh, it's tomorrow. Maybe this is what they'll do and then having to wait a week. So thank you, Hiroshi Lockheimer. Thank you, everyone involved. We know That's that right. all, all about Android or as it's now known, all about Pixel is a priority in your marketing plan. So thank you. We know that you did this particularly for us, and we appreciate that. So thank you for that. Um, And big time thank you to Duncan Jaffrey from Ozdroid.net for joining us uh, from the future. It's great to have you back, Duncan. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me along. It's good here in the future. Nice and warm. Yeah. Oh, well, that's very pixely. It's it's, uh, it's it's cold and damp outside. So that's uh, that's refreshing to know. I guess you're, you're now in your summer, right? As we heading into spring, heading into spring. Okay. All right. Well, you're getting close. You're getting there. It's good to have you, Duncan. It's always great to get you on the show. And uh, sometimes it seems like it, it, maybe my memory is, is mistaken, but I think it's true. I think you've been on other times when the pixel hardware has been fresh and new. It just kind of seems like at least on this show, sometimes you're beat. <laughs> seems to be that yeah. and MWC, uh, if that ever happens again. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. Um, I'm sure it will <laughs> to some to some degree. Um, this was this is going to be a little bit of a different show. Obviously, you know anybody who's been following and cares about Android probably knows that Google had a very big hardware event today, and so the majority of the show is just going to be focused on that. And part of the reason for that is because not one of us, not two of us, but all three of us actually have the hardware that, that Google announced at the event. Uh, you can you can trust that Duncan does too, even though we don't have his video right now. Uh, but we have the Pixel 6 and the Pixel 6 Pro. Ron, you have the Pixel 6. I which, have the Pixel 6. Which colorway did you go with? Um, I'm curious. What is, the, what is the color? It's the green and yellow one. What is that one called? Oh, okay. That's that's a I nice was, looking one. I, uh, I can't remember. Sorta, Sorta Seafoam is what it's called. Sorta Seafoam. 
which, and it's nice. hard to see in the lighting and all this sort of stuff, especially with my light, but it's like a little seafoam green and a little darker mint green along the top. You can see it's kind of there too. Uh, yeah. yeah. And Duncan, what color did you get? I've got the Pixel 6 in the black color, which is you went, very you went shiny. You went standard black. Did they let you I choose did. Or, did, or did you have to, did they just, you take what they got, what they sent you? They did not let me choose, but they gave me what I would have chosen. All right. Well, that, <laughs> Very yeah, nice. That's a win-win. <laughs> it is. There you go. And it's not black through and through. It's like black on the, it's, it's the dual tone. So it's like black on the bottom and like a dark gray up top, right? Yep. Yeah. So the actual phone itself has got the black Cyclops bar, but the color above and be, uh, top and below is actually more a smoky gray. It's a bit hard to see with the reflection from outside, but the this colour you see up top um, is actually what the colour of the whole device is, but the lower half is glass, and so that's reflecting more than the plastic up top. Yeah. So oh, they look okay. like they're two separate colours, but they're actually not if 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 I was able to reproduce it. Is 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 it plastic up top? It certainly no. feels different to me. Oh, okay. I'm like looking at mine a, right now, trying to, trying to figure that out. Oh, look, yeah. that's a very nice color. It does feel a little yeah. different. I don't know if it's plastic, though. I think it's yeah. I, I, I think was it's glass. That it was all glass, but yeah. but I mean, the, the materials are definitely different, at least to a certain degree. I don't know if the materials, you know, between the glass are, are different. I know it's um, I know well, it's look, Gorilla Glass Victus. Let's not get let's not get two firsthand experiences with the device here, John, uh, Jason. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah, we, it, it should be it should be noted that okay, we all got these devices from Google uh, in yep. in advance, right? In in advance of the event, but make no mistake, and I'm certainly not the first person to talk about this. There are rules that are that are intertwined here, so there's only cer certain things that we can actually talk about. We can't actually share our like deep experience with it. Mind you, I only got mine last night, so I don't have a whole lot of deep experience with it. But today we're going to do our very best to navigate around that minefield uh, in order to, yes, show you what we have. But also we have full reign to talk about everything they announced today, because whether we had the devices or not, we'd have opinions based on what they announced. We just can't talk about our experience with those things. So it's maybe be a little challenging, but we can do this. I have full full faith in us. Yeah. Uh, so let's yeah. start with the Pixel Six, Ron. You you, you fi fire this off because you you have that yeah. in hand, and we can talk about that a little bit. So yeah. So I also got a nice. I got, we got the nice little case. I got a little pink case that le that holds on to it. But yeah. So the Pixel Six. Um, for me, the the most interesting thing coming out of today's event was the price. Uh, Pixel Six for five hundred ninety nine dollars, um, and it comes with a matte aluminum frame. Uh, along with a 6.4 inch 90 hertz flat display, um, 1080p OLED display. It's got 8 gig of RAM, 128 gig or 256 gig storage options, um, a 4,614 milliamp battery, um, and the MM Wave 5G only on Verizon for $100 more. Um, and it's got an 8 megapixel selfie cam with an 84 degree field of view. Um, which is interesting. And what I love is the in-screen fingerprint uh, reader as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, and and uh, and th this kind of gets into both devices a little bit, but there, as we all know, and we've talked about, you know, and, and leading up to this, uh, running the, t the Google's new Tensor chip, so their system on a chip mm -hmm. that they've produced themselves, um, the 50 megapixel primary camera on the back, as well as the ultra wide lens, um, and you get three years of OS updates and five years of security updates, which Jason ties into the comment, the commentary we had last week about how OS updates and security updates, like the, the longer lifespan of a device is become so important in these past couple of weeks. And here, Google Google chiming in saying three years of OS updates, five years of security updates. You can buy, you can spend six hundred dollars on this phone confidently knowing that'll it be protected for up to five years, which is a long time. Yeah, I, I think five years is a great uh, a great line in the sand to draw. I think it's Google's responsibility. I think I said this last week, but I really believe that it's Google's responsibility to set the precedent yeah. for the rest of the players in the ecosystem. Uh, and so doing that is great. How do you feel about the three years? Because uh, there were a lot of people that were like, okay, we knew that it was five years of security updates. Is it going to be three years of, of major updates or is it going to be four years? Obviously, you know... 
it's it's the it's the less of the two. Um, does that feel like like they're undershooting it uh, to you, Duncan, or are you satisfied with that? No, look, I. I like the original Pixel days with the difference between the small and the big one was the size. And so what you ended up with was exactly the same device and a choice of sizes. Um, and I'd still prefer they do that. But in these days of price differentiation and the desire for a flagship and a premium device, um, I can understand the, the their desire to market one as the more pro device and one as the standard. I'm glad that most of the internals are the same. Um, I think the changes that they made between the two devices um, feel almost contrived, like intentionally done to make one slightly better. And I do think okay. that leaves me a little bit sad. Mm. Okay. Now they're both getting though, the commitment to the five years of, of security updates. So that's good. Um, yeah. And that would, that would be strange I, I, I if they that, didn't actually. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a, a good step forward. Um, and it's three years with a promise of maybe one extra for the OS updates. And, you know, if that keeps going further and further, because the elephant in, in the room is obviously that the iPhone gets fairly good support um, it does. going forward. And a lot of that has to do with them controlling their own ecosystem and their chipset. And whilst I haven't had it officially confirmed, uh, speaking with Google and others, you know, it seems very interesting that the very first time that Google has their own chipset is the first time that they promise to be able to support it much longer because they're no longer bound by another vendor supporting the SOC in that in order to sort of get longer support. And that could be an unattended or a very intended on their behalf, but a good benefit for us in actually getting longevity out of these devices as future pixels come along and they get more confident with their SOC. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense that, that, that that's probably a, a large reason why they're able to do that. But that doesn't leave a lot of Hmm. A lot of optimism for the competitors in the marketplace who are running Qualcomm uh, you know, chipsets inside of their devices for them to be able to match. Because at a certain point, Qualcomm stops kind of supporting some of these chipsets and it becomes much more difficult to, to eke out longer term support. Um, so this is a power that Google has because it's creating the chips and it's setting great precedent. But this has always been kind of my question about like elongating the update cycle for some of these devices. Like, uh, of course, that makes sense for Google, but there's a lot of like lesser players that even if they wanted to get five years, uh, five years of updates out of their device, like the hardware literally could not take it. Like it wouldn't be able to hold up, you know, five years down the line as a user, you might not want to use it, even though it's technically five years updated, it might be the, you know, as slow as molasses as a result of it. So there's other issues to, to iron out as well. Yeah, well, I have noticed Android updates of late seem to get less laggy and, and less intensive on old chips. Um, there's a huge aftermarket recycling market within families and outside families. It's better for the environment, obviously, to keep these devices in active service longer and longer and longer um, as they get passed down and reused. Just because you don't use a phone long term doesn't mean someone else may not. But, mm -hmm. you know, if market pressure works the way it's supposed to, Apple already operates this way. If Google can operate this way, that might put pressure on, say, Samsung to do something similar with the chips they control. And if, if larger and larger sections of the market move towards long chip support, Qualcomm may have no choice but to actually support the chips because it's not like they don't. They economically choose not to. I don't claim to know the ins and outs of how the company works, but you can imagine there's no technological reason why. And we see that in the hacking community where there are people who retrospectively create drivers to support chips going forward forward. And so yeah. clearly it's technically possible and market pressures is the only thing that's going to change that. And so more players that move to a, a longer support on the chipset might make that transition longer. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Do you, this is a totally random question. I, I think I believe the answer to be no, but do you think there's, there's any possibility in the future that Google does what Qualcomm does with its chips and offers up the tensor chips to other manufacturers? Could you see Google doing that at all? Or are they going to hold this pretty close to their, their vest? I would think, and this is you know, total speculation, that totally. Google is attempting 
to become their own version of Apple. You know, clearly yeah. they are the world leader in hardware profits. Um, they may not, their market share of sales continues to slowly reduce globally, but their profit share remains pretty steadily. So they're selling less phones and making the same amount of the profit. That's, that's a very good business model to be in. Uh, and I can't imagine that Google is not going to want to do that. And it's clear with the Pixel line, they are looking for a uh, individualization and the secret source, even with the early drops of software features that we'll get to discuss. Um, but now they've been doing that for a few generations now. I just don't think they would offer this sort of secret source going forwards. I think it's going yeah. to be their attempt to create their own hardware and software line. Yeah. And they've, they've got a lot of faith in it. They've doubled the amount of their orders. I can't remember. I didn't put the story in the rundown, but they're, you know, the orders for this phone, they've, they're really expecting this to do well. And I mean, I'm, I'm in no position to argue with that. The early kind of impressions prior to today's event have been incredibly positive. Very, very few, you know, that I've seen of people being like, oh, this looks like a horrible phone. Like people are really excited about this lineup. And and so part and so part of that is is that and with that doubled order is you know like I feel like Jason I mean how many of these I mean we're on Pixel Six right so six of these announcements have we yeah. gone through where we're yeah. like this is the one where they're going to break through this is the one where the Pixel is going to become a mainstream phone and all that sort of all that sort of jazz and I feel like we've seen sales numbers pick up from generation to generation you know maybe not so much with the five because I feel like the five was a real messy kind of rollout with the naming and yeah. all this sort of stuff but there's yeah. something about this rollout that may that I know I've said it before that makes me seem like they're really going for it with this one so. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the six, uh, the six, the the salmon looking one here. Which, yeah, it's it's definitely an eye catching uh, device, I, both I, online I mean, and in I, person. I gotta say, yeah. I mean, I know I don't want to talk about our first hand experience with the devices, but I like the two color versions. I like all the colors that we've seen from it. I think it yeah. just it stands. It, it it like the thing about me. The thing about phones and all the situations, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in with the design paradigm. And what I hate is that I hate all the phones that look the same. I hate all the phones where if you cover up the logos, you can't tell you who, you know, you, you, you don't know what manufacturer came from or what kind of type of phone it is. This stands out on its own as a unique design in, in a sea of, you know, kind of sameness in the Android space, at least in my opinion. Yeah, indeed. Um, so the other device, of course, on tap here is the Pixel 6 Pro. That's the other one that I have here. I can't remember what this colorway is called, but um, it kind of it kind of has like a peach ish quality to it, I suppose. Like, I think when I looked online, you know, it, this seemed like the wider color. Basically, I didn't want to go with a black slab because I've done black slab a million times. So I went with this and uh yeah, I mean, you know, these are they're, they're solid looking devices, no matter how you slice it. But when you look at the Pixel 6 Pro, like very, very sort of sunny. There we go. Thanks for looking that up, Burke. Um, you know, some some market differences as far as like how it's styled. You've got this stainless steel um, uh, frame as opposed to the the like matte aluminum frame on the Pixel 6. So things are, you know, a little shinier. Technically, I guess that means that it's probably a little bit more durable uh, long term. I imagine stainless steel probably, get, you know, is a step higher on the durability front. 6.7 inch uh, display, 120 hertz curved display. So this does have the curves on the sides, uh, whereas the, the 6 does not. Uh, 1440p LTPO OLED. Now, LTPO is what uh, powers the dynamic refreshing of the display anywhere between 10 hertz to 120 hertz. So be curious to see how that works uh, in practice, how that does. We've seen you know similar systems in other phones, so I'm curious to see how the Pixel 6 Pro does that. 12 gigs of RAM, so you get a lot of, a lot of memory uh, right out of the gate. That's great, especially, in my opinion, great for longevity if there are going to be offering up to five years of updates, you want a powerful phone with a lot of RAM because five years from now is 12 gigs of RAM going to be 
what it is now, no, it's it's going to be a lesser number. But I think that's I think that's enough to get you some good extension on its lifespan. Um, anywhere from 128 to 512 gigs of storage, 5,003 milliamp hour battery. So <laughs> pushing 5,000 milliamp hours on the battery, which you know I'm super curious about the battery life of this device. Um, also, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it any justice with this camera that I have rigged up. I don't think I have the lighting in the right spot, but it has this this other camera right here. This is the additional 4x folded telephoto lens, and uh, all I got to all I got to say is you got to see this thing in person. Once you see this thing in person with that lens, you know it's really interesting. But uh, super curious to see how that 4x telephoto looks. Um, you know, the, the results of that, I, I, I personally feel like when it comes to a camera system, a telephoto to me is a little more important than an ultra wide. I think ultra wides are nice for sure, but I'd rather have just a nice quality telephoto so I can get some, get some nice extensions. So I'm curious about that. Um, the selfie cams on both of the phones are updated. They're both a little bit wider, but the one on the Pixel 6 Pro is an ultra wide selfie cam, 11.1 megapixel selfie cam, 94 degrees field of view, um, which if I'm not mistaken, there was, was it the Pixel 4 that had the ultra wide option on the front? It was. The Pixel 4 had I the two selfie cameras. Yes, I think it was. Yeah, yeah if memory serves. Yeah. So you had the option of doing that. Yeah. And that was actually, that actually came in handy a number of times. So I, I like that that's there. So, oh, and I didn't mention the price on this eight ninety nine to start, which I think is surprising like to a lot of people. I, I I like the prices. I don't know. I mean, that that was my one one of my main aside from some of the other stuff we're gonna talk about later on with the software. For me, I was like, I I did one of those like what? How much? Like I yeah. I thought these were gonna be at least one to two hundred dollars more on each device. Like I thought yeah. we were looking at like I thought we were looking at like an eight ninety nine and a ten ninety nine set for the, these two, but yeah, great. And I wasn't I wasn't quite at that point. I was thinking that the six Pro was going to be nine ninety nine. It was going to be that sub thousand dollar option with you know more memory or more memory slash and or more storage that gets you up in the you know closer to thirteen hundred or something like that. But yeah, when the rumored prices started leaking around the the target leaks that we saw a few days ago, I was like, oh man, that's that's like way less than I expected. That tells me that that I think I think I mean, totally guessing here, right? But uh, the Tensor chip, you know, in in uh, yep. built internally, that's going to hopefully bring the price down. Also, maybe Google's just eating the cost on these things because they really want it to be a success. So they're offering really high quality value, uh, which is which continues to be a Pixel kind of landmark, right? Is is value brand? Uh, what do you think I about think that, Duncan? That, yeah, I think they edged away a little bit um, with that. I've been a big fan of the A-series devices because I think they deliver really yeah. good quality at a really good price. And the last couple of um, flagship devices for me have actually been a little bit lacking to the point where I hadn't advised people to get them and the prices were that little bit higher. I think what they've done here is in the lack of a 5A rollout internationally, because it was really just US and Japan, I think they've got a really strong argument and offering here that the, you know, the Pixel 6, whilst not quite as affordable as the A series was, does offer really good value. Um, and mm -hmm. I even think the 6 Pro does to a degree, but um, it it is a very interesting line and, you know, I'll have to use it and be able to talk about using it to, to really know. But I think they've actually managed to hit that real original Pixel Nexus style feel of this is an affordable flagship. You're right. You know, I was expecting it to be higher from all the specs that were, were leaking. And, you know, $9.99 launching price in Australia, that, that is 50% of the price of some of the premium phones. And so mm. that it's it's more than fifty percent of the phone, most definitely. Um, you know, the screen may not be as good, and it's missing a camera, and it doesn't have millimeter wave in the six model versus the pro. Um, but at that price, like it, it's an incredibly compelling device with a very good chip, likely to get very good software updates, five years of support. Um, I can't wait to be able to talk about all the features that are in it. And then you step up to that pro. It's not a huge jump either. Um, it's not, you know, you get up to the 512 gigs of RAM, but I'd question anyone who's needing that these days with the ubiquity of cellular connectivity. Um, but there's really good value 
for what they are. You can get better value phones at a live price that are great, but this is the first year in years that I'm actually thinking of recommending a premium smartphone. Mm. Well, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, Yes, so cool stuff here as far as the hardware is concerned. But Ron, Ron you you have a uh, <laughs> you have kind yeah, of a I mean, nice is, punctuation to all of this. This is uh, yeah, and this kind of harkens back to what we were just discussing. And this is the sad trombone of the day: is that like you know, okay, so you know, Google's got their their chip, they've got new designs. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they you know we you know they really are committed to this. They really want to make it work. Jason, like you said, you know a lot of positive feedback and a lot a lot of positive of response uh, from the uh, presentation, both in the press as amongst I was looking on social, I was looking for kind of distinctions. Um, but unfortunately, Google couldn't quite finish the last mile. Uh, during and after the event, uh, lots of potential Pixel 6 and Pixel 6 Pro owners complained loudly about issues with the Google Store online with going to actually purchase the phone. Um, it refused to let many complete their transaction, uh, even up to hours after the event. They were just, uh, it looks as if it was uh, overwhelmed with response of people trying to purchase the phones, which is like, one of those situations as a retailer is awesome because you've got such a great response and the last thing you want to have happen, you know, like Ugh. it's, 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 yeah. uh, it's horrible. Um, now that said, here we are, you know, nearly what, not, you know, you know, how many, you know, almost 10, 10, 11, 12, almost 12 hours after the event. Um, and it's been fully resolved. So now anybody can go purchase the phone. They've worked through yeah. the volume, but that initial crush, uh, you know, and people, you know, people who hear, you know, people watching the video can see, you know, people complaining tweets about it, about having, you know, having one in the cart. And then all of a sudden is that a stock and all that sort of stuff oh. and taking hour, hours to get an order across. I mean, it, it reminds me of, you know, back in the day at a previous job when I worked uh, for a, a comic book publisher and we'd, you know, make a comic book and it would sell out on day one and everybody like, oh, that's great. You sold out. I'd be like, no, that's awful. Like, that's the last thing that would happen because now people can't get it. You know, like right. it's, it's, you know, that's not always a good thing. You know, your site crashing because so many people want to buy it. It means people aren't buying it, you know, like that, that there's some sort of problem there. So, um, you know, hopefully Google irons us out and, and smooths it um, as they, uh, you know, resolve the issue. But that's got to be a bummer if you're watching this and you're like, yes, I want that. And you can't make it happen. Ugh. So I, Yeah. I mean, you know, it really is uh, kind of perspective is everything on that because in the moment yeah. it sucked, right? Everybody was watching. I mean, I was doing live coverage with Leo and the entire time he's on the page trying to order it and still at oh, the end, man. he's like, it's not letting, you know, the entire time he wanted to, he wanted to buy it and it just wasn't letting him that extended for hours afterwards. But in the grand scheme of the release of the pixel six and the six pro, that was the first let's say four hours of its life, you know, in public yep. um, versus however many months or, you know, the next year that it's going to be in the spotlight. Molly Fudd in Discord said the store being down was disappointing, but if that ends up to be the biggest issue, it's a huge win for Google. Well, that's totally true, right? I like, so. perspective yeah, I, know, is I mean, it's, it's just a bummer because you don't want that to be the, the experience. You don't want that to be, yes, people, yeah, totally. exactly. You don't, you don't want that to be the thing people are talking about. So I'm glad they got it resolved yeah. quickly and hopefully people can get their phones. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It, um, it comes yeah, down we, to what's the cost of that marketing. So it, it's a good news story. Oh, we can't get your phone. It's so popular. But you're right, Ron. Is that that means customers aren't getting your phone? Is that customer yep. returning? Are they are they yep. are they angry? Yeah. Was it a, was it an impulse? Yep. Uh, I can't imagine it's ever not good to sell as much as you possibly can in the minute someone wants something. Absolutely, and especially considering just how dedicated to the promotional aspects of this device. Like, it's so obvious. Google wants this to be a huge success, and they've done a lot to make that happen. They've created some really compelling looking devices that, and and they're they're trying to capitalize on the excitement. Right, all, all of the promotion and marketing leading up to this day has been pretty successful. People have been re really reacting positively to it, and then you get to the point where you could finally open the floodgates and people can actually act on that excitement and they can't fulfill that promise you know so it's just like oh you just needed to stick the landing oh but i'm sure they'll get there i mean people are being able to to buy these devices now so um all right well that's the hardware and we've got more. It's this, like we said, this is all about Pixel today. So we're going to be talking more about this. We got to take a break. So let's take a quick break and thank the sponsor of this episode. And that is 
Audible. Ah, man, I've been using Audible uh, for years. I mean, so many years. My library is huge at this point. Audible is great. Audible Plus is another aspect of Audible. If you love your audiobooks like I do, it actually gives you full access to their popular Plus catalog. So it's all about giving members a chance to listen and discover uh, new favorites, not just the things that you're that you know about and that you're waiting for, but to explore different formats. So things like words plus music. That's a cool series that you can find on Audible Plus or a podcast that you've never considered before. Even theatrical performances, you can find all of that on Audible Plus. You can listen all you want to thousands of popular audiobooks, original entertainment, podcasts, including ad-free versions of your favorite shows and exclusive series. They're all available to download or stream, so you can you know, as, as you can with all of Audible's uh, content library, you can listen anywhere, anytime, on any device. You won't even lose your spot if, you're, if you pick up on another device. You can be able to pick up right where you left off. It's really useful. To use your Audible membership, you're going to need to download the Audible app. The Audible app is free. Uh, it can be installed on all smartphones, on all tablets. Uh, it's one of the first things... I mean, I can say it with the Pixel 6 and the 6 Pro, right? Like I, anytime I get a new device and I have to set them up, there's like an order. It's it's not like a written order. Like I must do this one first and this one. But I mean, Audible's in that top tier. If I don't, if I'm not logged into my Audible account on my device, then I then I'm not listening to that audiobook that I'm already in the middle of on my other device. So it's one of the first apps that I installed. They they made a lot of changes to the app uh, in recent months, actually, to make it just a better experience overall for driving and navigating your library and everything. It's just a really great experience. Listening to Audible will make you feel inspired, connected, and it's available all in one app. Audible Plus is your playlist for life. And I can't not, I can't not make one, at least one recommendation. I haven't started this title yet, but it's called The Storyteller. Uh, teller tales of life and music by Dave Grohl. Um, I've just always been a Dave Grohl fan back, back, you know, in the days of Nirvana and then of course, Foo Fighters and everything. Uh, and so now he has a book out. It's like 10 and a half hours. So, and I love rock, uh, autobiographies and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to uh, diving into this title. Uh, so what are you waiting for? There's so much to be found. Delve into your next title on Audible with Audible Plus. New members can try Audible Plus for 30 days. All you have to do is download the Audible app that I was just talking about and get started with a free trial at audible.com slash allaboutandroid. Or you can text if you'd prefer all about Android, all one word to 500 500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E, audible.com slash all about Android or text all about Android to 500, 500 and you can start your free trial today. And we thank Audible for their support of all about Android. All right, now we get into some of the software. We've talked a little bit about the hardware and we've shown that off. We can't really show you the software, so you're going to well, have to wait I on that. Well, actually, one thing before we move on from hardware that I forgot to yeah. mention, Jason, before yeah. the break, yeah. um, I lost the bet. Oh, that's true. You did lose a bet, right? Because what did I, we I, not I, see I, at the event? I, I was ready to for some major eating crow on the show. And Jason, I got to thank you for not rubbing it in my face because Lord <laughs> knows if the, tur the tables were turned, I would have yeah. just, it would have been nonstop. Been, but you, yeah. Yeah, I you I wouldn't let you get away with it, but you I would have so led with it. it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, totally. Um. So yeah, I I I was convinced we would see the Pixel foldable at least in yeah. some way, shape, or form, and we did not. Nope. So uh, nope. I will. I, I have to take that on the chin uh, as as I got that one wrong. I'm sorry. So. <laughs> it's okay. We forgive you. Hey, these were guesses, anyways. One of us was going to be wrong. So yeah, true. True. I'm yeah, just I'm so. just happy it was you, Ron. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but I did I did think it was interesting how much of you know because we talked about we've seen these phones we saw so many leaks it was on display at the Google store in New York you know the software really gets the spotlight in the in the presentation I thought I, I don't know you know like it the hardware is yeah. great the tensor chip and stuff like that but like the, where this really shines with some of the stuff under the hood in terms of the software side of things so well and this is where things have sh shown shined shown uh, so, for for a few years now right like Google has really doubled and tripled down on its AI prowess 
And uh, now with the Tensor chip inside being just like, in many ways, like created for AI you know, to power everything that, that Google wants to do with AI, we end up with some really cool features uh, on the Pixel phone as a result of that. And this this series, more than any of the other Pixels, I think we're going to, you know, if, if today's news is any indication, and a lot of this we've already heard about, there were some new features that we'll talk about that we hadn't heard about. But if it's any indication, future Pixel drops could be very interesting uh, because they've got a lot more, uh, you know, room to play with uh, around the Tensor chip. And Google is going to be really motivated to show this stuff off. Like, see, this Pixel, you know, this Pixel update brings you this amazing new feature that can only be done on a Pixel because we've got the AI, you know, uh, focused hardware on the device and we're Google. We do this better than anybody. So um, so let's talk a little bit about what what we do know about that's coming out with the Pixel right now that's related to that. Big, um, big features in the camera. The camera is, of course, a huge focus of the Pixel. It has been a huge focus of the Pixel lineup because they've had a great main camera for years. I'm really happy that they up updated everything. But I've always wondered, like, well, what happens when they take their AI prowess that, that they've built over time to kind of make up for the fact that they're not updating the camera hardware? And then they update the camera hardware. What do you come up with? So they've made uh, a bunch of changes. One of them uh, is that they've re-engineered the camera software to integrate a new feature called Real Tone. And they actually spent some some quality time during the demonstration on this, which I think is really important. Google has has dropped the ball in its history when when you know using the camera to represent darker skin tones. Uh, we've seen this in the news plenty of times, not just about Google, about other manufacturers as well. But Google is kind of saying and very publicly saying, hey, we've spent the time to re-engineer, to improve the camera hardware and the AI analysis of what's coming through the camera to better represent people of all different skin tones. And uh, so, you know, they've corrected image rendering, um, things like historically, you know, these certain situations would result in like stray light coming into the image and it washes out the darker skin or it makes things, you know, kind of gray and grainy, um, not representative of what you know, what that person looks like in real life. So super necessary stuff. And, and, uh, I was during the live announcement, you know, Leo was saying, you know, I think Apple does this, but Apple doesn't talk about it. It's interesting that Google talks about it. And I was just kind of thinking like, actually, I think this is a good thing that Google's talking about it. A, to raise awareness around the fact that this stuff happens, but B, also to hold itself accountable and to say, hey, we're making a big deal of this, so you can too. It, it almost gives everybody awareness and permission to now hold their feet to the fire and say, okay, you, you figured it out or this still needs improvement, but at least to know that they care and that they're working on it because it's important. Um, other features, let's see here, face unblur, which we had heard about. Um, and this has to do with multiple images being snapped at once. So when you take a, a picture of someone, uh, it's actually snapping the same image on two different cameras and then doing kind of like a composite thing. So if one of the cameras, you end up with a blurred face, it can kind of bring in the sharper face from the other. Uh, so that's good. There's a motion mode that I'm looking forward to playing around with. This is for action shots. They use the example of like being in a subway and you're taking a picture of someone who's standing in front of a moving subway and the result that you get, it's kind of like a long exposure shot. It uh, the, the cameras are able to pick up that motion and have the foreground, the person be perfectly, you know, sharp and everything in the background kind of have like a smeared quality to it. So it's kind of an extension of like the, the bokeh, um, processing that they've been doing. And then of course, magic eraser can't, can't not mention magic eraser because it fulfills a promise from years ago about removing a face a fence. Although I'm, I'd be really surprised if this feature actually did that, but this feature is all about removing objects that you uh, don't want in the background of your shots. And it can, it can uh, propose these edits so it can say, hey, do you want to remove these objects? Or you can draw it in or you can select supposedly. I haven't you know, obviously I haven't played around with it yet, but uh, select features or, or something in the background and say, I want this out of the shot and boom, it's gone. So are you, are you optimistic about these, uh, these features, Duncan? What do you think? 
I'm incredibly optimistic. Uh, I think the original Pixel reframed camera photography. Um, if it's not already in the Hall of Fame, it certainly should be. From memory, it, it is. Um, and, you know, there's been criticism of late that the same software and same hardware was in the device. So it's really nice to see Google come at photography from multiple places now. So they've got this new hardware. They've, they've finally got a good multi um, camera set up in there. I've, I very much believe in the utility of a normal, a wide and an, an ultra. And um, for years, I said how hey, you didn't need that. And then I got a really good camera that had it. And now I can't sort of survive without it. I, I have use cases for all of them and the, and the right lens does the right job at the right time. And I'd love to get my hands on a 6 Pro and really see what that telephoto does. But moving into the software space, um, I think you're right that Google really does lead from the front. You know, it's easy to criticise people who are at the tr at the leading edge, and we all remember there were situations with Google Photos um, detecting um, certain ethnic ethnic groups as um, uh, different types of animals and so forth. But they lent into that. They they apologise. They work with the communities and increasing their sample size and, and getting um, things like real tone and working more with, you know, ethnically diverse populations and uh, people of all um, races and creeds to to get the algorithms, which is what they are, and we all know that algorithms have bias, is to proactively yeah. work to remove that bias can be nothing but commended. And will, will they stumble on the way? Maybe. But like you said, they're doing it in public, which means they're inviting people to say when it doesn't work. And I believe that invitation does come with a real commitment to one, improving, but two, um, diversity. Now, is that good for their bottom line? Maybe. Um, is, is it disingenuous? I, I, I don't think so. I think a lot of modern companies actually do really believe that in, in these principles. And yeah, I, I, do I don't too. think they should be dismissed. Um, yeah. But then you look at some of the more exciting features. We've been waiting for a magic eraser since I.O. several years ago. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and while they, they didn't demo on stage removing of chain link fence, and um, I'm not sure that made it in there, um, what they did demo and the, the way it looks, you're right, I can't wait to get hands-on time and actually play with that um, because these are really great features. And remember, this is today. If they're already at this stage, imagine what they're going to do in the future when they get more yeah. training data. Um, and of course, you no know, uh, privacy being first and foremost, they assure you that everything's done on device, that nothing is sent off. So the, the edits that users use aren't going to be used to train the model. It's right. Safe. Yeah, that's important. But yeah, very excited. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I, well, you know, camera cameras at the top of, uh, of a lot of people's use case on their smartphones. So I think these features are going to be some really interesting interaction. It, it's almost if you look at the if you look at the use case of the device, the camera probably dwarfs the actual phone usage of it, right? Like yeah. it, it it should be it should be say that these are cameras with phones attached to them. That's basically what it is. You know, there's so many people you know le lean on that camera and use it, whether it's you know amateur or professional photography, down to you know Instagram and you know and just and Twitter and 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 you know taking pictures of your family and and things like that. You know, like the camera is such a key piece of the puzzle, and the phone just seems like less and less every every year, doesn't it? Um, but yeah. that didn't st that didn't stop Google from surprise us with a whole bunch of phone based uh, software which I gotta admit did not see coming like good job on on key you know like we're, we wonder with all the leaks and things like that what we'll be surprised by um, so two big things that were kept secret until today's event uh, wait times which is this is just as as a as a Disney Disneyland and Disney World fan this cracks me up and blows my mind um, you can see the current and projected wait time for placing a call to its whole free business number. So if you are calling, you know, let's say you need to change your flight and you're calling JetBlue's toll-free number, wait times will tell you the the current and projected wait times of people who've called on that, which is crazy. Um, it's inferred data from call length data that they've collected, and it's all anonymized data. So don't worry, they're not tracking your phone calls or your, your toll-free number calls. But it's the equivalent of knowing how long you have to wait to ride Space Mountain. Right. This yeah, is, right. You know, like this, this is, this is it. It's crazy. So like, you know, like, uh, you know, the number of times you're like, oh, I've got to call customer service. I don't want to sit on hold and that sort of thing. Now you can get a sense of how long you'll have to wait and you can make that decision if you're going to make that call or not, which I think is crazy. Um, and then the, the second one is direct my call where the Google assistant transcribes automated messages and menu options and directory trees. 
uh, and you can tap the options in real time and it's all powered by duplex. That's neat. I like that, that a lot. I will use that. Neat. I will definitely yeah. use that. That is super, super cool. Um, and all audio transcriptions are saved on the device only. So that's important to note there. Um, and then uh, what's even more interesting, uh, moving away from the phone, but just in terms of using Assistant and interacting with the device, uh, Gboard for Pixel 6 offers uh, something new called Assistant Voice Typing, where you can use the wake word, you can say, hey, G, type, and it types a message. You, you know, Commands to edit include clear, which removes the last sentence, clear all, uh, delete the last word, delete, and then the last word, uh, undo, um, you can drop the cursor anywhere in text uh, and uh, uh, and then continue voice typing. Uh, today, dropping that cursor turns off the voice typing. Um, and it supports emojis, typing emojis, which is crazy. Uh, so if you are a voice typer, uh, this, this, this is the, this is the update you've been waiting for. Uh, so yeah. So Duncan, yeah. out of all, th out of all three of these, which ones, the, which ones blew your mind? Did any of them or? Um, as an Australian, a lot of the call screening features haven't been available here, but Google has oh. actually announced that some of the old, no, it's a good uh, day. Some of the older features are now coming here. Um, yeah. Molly and chat actually found out a few weeks ago that the call waiting feature had actually been enabled. Um, and now it looks like we're getting the call screening, um, feature officially but i have to say on behalf of everyone who suffers between getting messages from me i i send two types of messages messages with voice typos and messages with hand typos and i now see that this is a 50 percent improvement on on my messages um uh, i'm really looking forward to it being better you know listening to google talk about this feature with on-device real-time processing um, I know when I try to use voice to text on existing phones and there's bad uh, cell connection, you just don't get that line out. So moving that model on device, improving yeah. its speed and, and actually making it natural language. So um, it's very hit and miss with the current voice typing when you say, you know, comma, new line, uh, whether it works or not. And to see that Google's actually said, no, people are going to want to say this. Let's hard code that in almost as a hot word. I'm super excited for that because I do do a lot of voice typing and voice dictation. Um, but all, you know, I, I'm, to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm excited for all assistant features. I'm still a bit of an, an assistant fangirl uh, and uh, AI in general. So I think they're all great. But for me, voice typing has to, ha has to take it, if nothing more, to reduce the complaints about um, I get question mark, question mark, did you use voice to text again? <sighs> <laughs> and I and did I, I I don't know if I was talking or if Leo was talking when they were showing off a part of this but was it inferring punctuation at points um so in other words like when I do the voice typing as as anyone who does it right now I'm very used to saying period period question mark or whatever yeah. to, to kind of drop those in but I have to imagine that this is kind of getting to a point to where Google's AI can understand like, oh, this is an obvious end of the sentence. Oh, that sounded like an, you know, an upturn at the end of the sentence. That must be a question or whatever. Is, do, do either of you know if this has that or is that still a kind of an area that they have to explore? I don't know. I, saw, I, infer, oh. I, I inferred that it, was, that it had that, but I don't know for sure. Duncan, what do you think? I saw when they were doing the demos that when they used a key phrase to move on or something, it would put punctuation in. So it would full right. stop and capitalize the next, if you said new line. So, you know, th those parts of the demo certainly showed that if nothing else, it's attached to the phrases. Um, yeah, okay. And, and it also looks like it, it endures. So if you're having a conversation over text, uh, it looked like the um, the little microphone stayed active even after a message was sent. So I wonder if it's like a conversational chat interface. Yeah, I mean that makes sense because the um, the editing aspect um, that Ron you mentioned, like dropping dropping the cursor inside. Did that? Did that? Did we mention that? Basically, when you drop a cursor inside of something that you've done, you know, with voice chat, and you say, "Oh, actually, I need to insert this," you know, over here. If you do that now, it cancels out the the voice uh, dictation altogether, and you have to like reactivate it. It seems like now with this newer version, it like stays in that mode, kind of similar to what you're talking about, Duncan. So you could just drop it in the middle of what you've already typed, and it's still in that mode. So then you could very easily insert 
the thing by just speaking it and boom, it gets inserted in there as well. So it just seems like overall a way more robust voice typing uh, engine. It, it really becomes a, a voice UI rather than yeah. text-to-speech. Um, and, and that's right. really exciting. And it, yeah. it makes me wonder once again, are they training a model or training the data or reviewing the data? Um, you know, we all know that we have a whole pile of Google devices in our devices, in our houses, um, and with conversational interfaces. I can't help but think that this won't help you know, in, inform the voice UI on Google Home devices and smart screens and, and whether or not we see features like this actually make their way in there um, so that you could actually conversationally message using that device and you then all, all come up with a true cloud instance of everything, um, you know, when you're using services that are at least open. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, along these lines, we also have Live Translate, which we knew uh, was coming. And this is on-device translation uh, of, of things like incoming messages, uh, viewfinder text, so, you know, through your camera, um, transcribed audio, everything on the fly. So it's almost like uh, it's similar to the, uh, what is it, the live caption, but on a deeper, more integrated level with translation. I mean, they, they showed off this cool conversation between Marie Kondo and another woman, and they were not speaking the same language, of course, and it was all happening in real time. We've seen, we've seen bits of this, but it seems like, again, what we're getting now is a it's all on device nothing is going to the cloud and you know with the tensor chip things are a lot faster so it becomes more of that like universal translator at the tip of your fingers uh instead of something that you have to be really intentional about and oh now i need to pull you know download that app from the whatever it's kind of baked in there and becomes um or, or if you're in a message exchange with someone who and you don't speak the same language you can have it set up to automatically translate that like to and from uh in both directions which is just that's crazy when you think about it. it's cool that we're there and that it's effective uh at doing that um and then finally uh, just real quick throw this in here uh, definitely not the best for last, but Snapchat on your Pixel 6, quick tap to snap, uh, which is essentially the tap on the back of the phone, the double tap. Um, in this case, it would launch a camera instance of Snapchat that works from the, the lock screen so that, you know, you can update your snaps uh, on the go even faster. This this feature has no use whatsoever for me. I hope that we can reassign the double tap action to something else, but there you oh, go. Oh, the things that we never wished uh, we had, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, cor corporate deals. This is, this is a yeah. corporate deal. Synergy yeah. right there for you, everybody. So Just think of um, the synergies. I know, exactly. There were a few years um, too late with Snap. Yeah, uh, I kind of felt yeah. that way too, but what do I know? Maybe I it should have been a TikTok anyways. interface. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was just going to say, like, what, what, TikTok is like, oh, we missed the opportunity. So, yeah. TikTok's like, no, we don't need the opportunity. We're doing yeah. just fine. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, well, uh, today was not only a big day for Google, Google with the Pixel and the Pixel 6, Pixel 6 Pro, and all this great software on the Pixels, uh, but it was a big day for uh, my assistant just went off. Um, yeah, it was a big that. day for, for Android because Android 12, 12 is now officially launched for Pixel owners. Um, yeah. So the Pixel 3 and up uh, can now install Android 12. Um, and later this year, it's going to roll out to Samsung Galaxy, OnePlus, Oppo, Realme, Techno, Vivo, and Xiaomi devices. Um, but important note, and I know a lot of the folks in the All About Android community uh, up, will apply to this. Uh, if you enrolled in the beta program, you need to listen. So instead of ending the Android 12 beta program now that it's official, Google is extending it in December. Uh, so for feature drops, bug fixes, stability, and performance updates, um, we're only guessing that this probably has something to do with the 12.1 update that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, if you remember, the rumors of the, the fast follow 12.1 update that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that will be a big foldable focused update. So maybe we're looking at something in December around foldable or whatnot, but like they're keeping the beta program open uh, because we do have a point one release coming uh, down the pike. So it seems so uh, interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, that said, Duncan, I'm dying to know what you think of Android 12 just in general material. You 
you know, rounder, bulbous uh, button controls. What What are your thoughts of the new OS uh, across the board? Um, I've picked up the Jason challenge from a few weeks ago where he said he's actually going to get a device and go the pure Google experience. I'm the huge user try. of, of uh, Nova, and I think that calls into an email a bit later. But um, yeah, I, I've, I've got a whole Android life that exists around these third-party apps. So this is such a monumental switch in um, UI design, in flavor, in, in sort of uh, interconnectedness in Google software offering that I'm going to not use everything I'd normally use and jump head into that experience. Um, it looks great. Um, you know, the idea of dynamic colors in the, the, the softer palette um, and, you know, to sit there and I would never create something that looks like that because I'm not a design creator. And actually to let go of, of controlling my phone and go, okay, these, th these are experts in this field. Let's see what they do with that. And so I am very excited um, that, you know, and it looks like it's more deeply integrated. I remember years ago, you'd get an update to a Google uh, UI and for years we'd be reporting, this app has finally gone material. This app has finally gone material. Yeah, um, that's and right. it was a very long tail. Yep. Whereas, you know, in the lead up to this, you've seen all the code teardowns um, that, you know, people like XDA have been doing. And, you know, these builds are coming in early, quick. So that, that alone, they're not all done, but this is probably the best cadence I've ever seen of them being pre-prepared before launch for their new UI. And I'm actually excited for the idea of actually having something integrated. I mean, I'm, I'm a Microsoft user as well. And the Microsoft 11 experience, I now have the choice of six different legacy UIs. And what's great is it's roulette. I don't know which one I'm going to get when I click on a feature these days. Um, <laughs> and I'd, I'd really like that not to be the Android experience. Um, and th this is still not up to Apple's level of polish. I mean, if we're just really honest and, you know, and look at the industry bar, Apple wouldn't release a device with everything being ready, but this is far better. And so I'm really excited for it. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a uh, kind of interesting what you were talking about as far as letting go and, and letting the experts, you know, be the ones to dictate, you know, how, how this is laid out for you for a while. Meanwhile, it's material you, it's all about you. So <laughs> it's like material you this time around it's it's actually about you like you're you're designing my home screen cuz you you can do it better than I can um I, like I I find myself in this position where like I know how my home screen has been for so long. It's functional. Everything's where I expect it to be. And so like I'm kind of regretting making that commitment on the show because now I have to actually live up to that and like wipe everything out on my home screen and kind of <laughs> do this fresh and see how it goes. I'm a little nervous about it, but I'm, I'm going to stick to it and see how it goes. I will <laughs> hold you to account because I'm now doing it simply based yes. on you saying it. See, and uh, just hearing that alone makes me realize I need to actually do it. So, uh, so I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Uh, we do have more. There's more coming up. Uh, we'll call it the Pixel Others. <laughs> I don't know why we'll call it that, but we will. Ron, we will. what else is there? I mean, it wouldn't be without some accessories, right? Like, what, yeah. what would an announcement be? And actually, D Duncan, you wrote about the new Pixel stand. Um, so very curious to hear your, your takeaway from that, but some of the stats about it, uh, it's a second, it's a second generation pixel stand and the pixel six family gets a 23, uh, 23 watt wireless charging. Other devices will get 15 watt wireless charging. Uh, it has a fan. Uh, so there you go. Uh, and $119, uh, price tag and it's coming soon. Um, and it's important to note that the, uh, pixel six doesn't ship with a charger. A new charger comes up to 30 watt, up from 18 on the previous charging brick, and you need 25 bucks for that. Uh, Duncan, what do you think about the Pixel stand? Is it is it a good stand? Is it a waste of money? $120? Is it worth it? Wow, there's a lot of questions. You can get. I, I'm a big believer in Qi. I've loved Qi since before Qi was popular, um, and uh, I'm very grateful that it's now here. So I'm a big fan of the wireless charging. Um, the the styling of this one, I think, is an improvement on the last one. Um, I am definitely going to be changing in software the charging speed from what they've said is there'll be two charging speeds where you can use the normal sort of uh, 15 watt or the 30 watt because I have my charging stand on my bedside and I do not want even an ultra quiet fan zing zooming around ne next to my uh, my bed. But the idea that the... Yes, Sorry, I yes, had to give you, you. give you a little yeah. uh, example. <laughs> 
Um, what that lacked was my wife's arm coming over and making direct contact <laughs> with my shoulder. Um, so almost the full experience. Um, the I I will also think of getting one for my office desk at home at work though, because the idea of it turning it into a mini. Google Home um, smart display where you're going to have some smart display functions and um, as I get deeper and deeper into the home automation um, ecosystem, it would be really great to have that kind of interface. So is it the most affordable? Probably not. But those extra software features, if you're deep into the home ecosystem or you want to use it as a photo frame or you want to use it as both, um, I don't think 129 is out of this world. And if you want ultra fast charging, um, it is definitely, um, you know, that they're, they're saying you're going to get, I, I can't remember the numbers now, but, you know, quite a significant amount of the battery back from a short charge. So, yeah, I'm really excited for um, a, a Google Qi Pixel stand. Yeah. Um, the the only stand, uh, charging stand that I could compare it to is the the one of the more recent OnePlus stands that has the fan in it. And I mean, it's 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 quiet, but it's still it's a fan. So I totally, I'm right there with you. Although at the same time, we we sleep with white noise in the room, so <laughs> maybe we just blend in there. I, I'm not sure, but uh, that seems that it also seems kind of like a a costly accessory. Um, although the the price that you quoted, I'm I'm realizing. Your pricing is probably different than our pricing, right? That's 119. It's yeah, it's seventy nine in the US, one hundred and nineteen in Australia. Oh, okay. Because I was gonna say, man, one hundred twenty dollars for this charging stand—that seems like a lot. But that, but it is a lot for you. <laughs> Does one hundred twenty dollars feel like a lot for a charging stand? Uh, well, not when that's what they normally cost here. Um, yeah, so I a good so. a good quality charging stand is going to come in that range. You can get them yeah. slightly cheaper, but you're then dealing with you know um, not as good quality brands. If you want to get a really good charger, you can get them from the eighty ninety dollars. But like I said, yeah. this this does come with that slight extra, and it's fast charging. Um, I didn't yeah. get the last Pixel stand at this price because I didn't think it represented value. The fast charging does change that slightly. Yeah, no question. And then how uh, how are we sitting as far as the lack of a charging uh, charging brick uh, in the box? I kind of don't care. Although although I want the the faster charge of the of the brick that they're selling. So you but can, what do you think? So you can you can pay for it then, Jason. That's how it yeah, works. Yeah, exactly. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, th I think it is a good point, though. I mean, we need to add on the price of these charging bricks to the current phone. Like if we yeah. want to compare across the generation, you could actually say that the Pixels this year are thirty dollars more expensive because it doesn't come with the um, the inbuilt charger. Environmentally, I can see why it's happening, and um, if if had to make a choice between convenience and and the environment, I think we should all choose the environment first. And if this prevents even one charger that's not needed getting out in, into the sort of you know uh, value stream, that's a good thing. Um, and we'll, we'll all know it saves significantly more than that. You know, the use case of, oh, well, what about Ma or Pa who buy one of these and get home and don't have a charger? Um, yeah, that may happen. It's probably going to be the lower end of the spectrum. Um, and, you know, I'm sure your carrier store salespeople are just as high quality perfectionists who know their craft and the ins and outs of all their products so well that that will almost never happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think everyone probably has a charger that that will do okay, uh, you know, hanging around somewhere. I do, but I'm I'm not the everyday user, right? Like I've, I've had so many phones walk through this house over the years. So yes, I've got a whole bunch, a whole gaggle of chargers. But I, like I said, I'm not the everyday user. But I have to imagine most people probably do at this point have a USB C uh, charger. And if you don't, twenty five bucks, I guess, is what it costs to get the Google one, anyways. Um, and then finally, before we wrap this all up and get to emails, uh, there's the, the pixel pass, which we did talk about. I can't remember if we talked about this last week or the week before no real surprises. As far as this is concerned to give you a refresher on what it is, it's an upgrade program, uh, for when you finance your phone you have to, it's only available when you buy direct from Google. 
but essentially it allows, uh, it gives you Google's preferred care protection plan, uh, YouTube premium subscription, play pass subscription, 200 gig Google one subscription. I don't know why I said that weird. Um, and then <laughs> it's an upgrade program for, um, for your smartphone every two years. So, and I don't know what the, what the details are there. It's basically every two years. So two years from now, you could, when the pixel eight comes out or whatever they call it, you could upgrade uh, from the six to the eight. But I don't know if that's like an apples to apples, like just give us that phone and we'll give you this phone. Um, I imagine it is because this is a payment plan, essentially. With the Pixel 6, you're paying 45 bucks a month. With the Pixel 6 Pro, you're paying 55 bucks a month. So I guess this is for people who finance their phones and pay slowly over time. And instead of just getting your phone, you get all these other things, the subscriptions, you get the, the extended uh, protection plan. It's not for me, but it's certainly for somebody. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you all think about this? I, I don't even know if they're offering this in Australia. Like, I don't know. Are they doing good? No, this no, is one of those things are that not. they aren't. No. Okay. No, um, most finance style options. So we don't get, um, uh, the ability to trade in devices either. And there's no Google store financing. What I, I will say is, again, I think this may be an indication of Google wanting to move more into that Apple-esque way of doing things. Yeah, um, right. Subscription revenue is definitely the new business model that everyone wants to get into. And I have to say, if, if they're wanting to compete head on with Apple on this, they've failed miserably. Um, and that is, you know, th their program per device is slightly cheaper and it gives you an annual guaranteed upgrade. Now, there's a lot of caveats in that. If the phone's damaged, you've got to pay a little bit of extra fee and so forth. But I think that Apple has more confidence in their aftermarket sales of devices than Google does, which is probably why their program is so much better. But if they're competing in that market, um, I'm not sure this represents great value. It really is just an amortized um, the plan, and I'm unclear if after two years, if after almost paying the phone off, do they take it off you? Because getting a new phone every year for a subscription price, I'm okay with losing the handset. Almost paying it off and then losing it, I'm less okay with. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, also, kind of along these lines, uh, there's some some trade-in value that um, that they're doing. And eBiker in the IRC chat pointed out that uh, eBiker's Pixel 5 was worth $405 trade-in. So the Pixel 6 Pro is uh, 694 for the 512 gig version. $405 trade for a Pixel 5. I feel like that's really high. <laughs> like I would not have yeah. imagined that you would get, uh, you know, that's, that's, I mean, that's 80% of the value because wasn't a Pixel 5 $500 when it sold new? I mean, I don't know which version eBiker got, but that's a pretty great trade-in value. So yeah. I do think that the Pixel 3, though, I think I saw someone tweet out the Pixel 3, you get $100 uh, of a trade in value. Right. So it steps off bad. a cliff there at a certain point, yeah. I suppose. But <laughs> got to start somewhere. Go. Got to start somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't, the pixel pass is not for me. I mean, I get, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know that they're going for it, but it does, you know, like, and, but it's so funny because I need to, I should look at how much I'm paying for YouTube premium and, and like the services that it does get to see whether it all is a good deal or not, but I don't think so. And I'm not financing. So, well, and that's it. Like you, this would only make sense if you actually wanted to finance your phone, right? Like there is no subscription only version of this. That's kind of what right. I was hoping that there would be. Like I'd totally be game for that. Like I'm a, I'm a pretty big Google fan. I've got a lot of their services. I'd I'd pay a, like a lump sum for the for a bundle of all their services potentially, but that's not what's on offer here. This is really about financing a phone. Yeah. So there you go. All right, so that's our um, all about Pixel uh, roundup. Uh, you know, the emails have nothing to do with the pixels, so just keep that in mind. At least I don't think they do. Um, so pretty exciting day and we are all very yeah. excited I, I would imagine maybe i'm speaking so, for you both but uh excited to actually have the hardware to to play around with well yeah, yeah I, just, I mean aside from aside from us actually getting the phones which is exciting all in all if you had to grade the presentation and the day and the rollout what what what, what great jason what grade would you give it um as far as like delivering on on yeah. what they're offering and everything, I mean, I, yeah. I think they did a pretty darn good job. Um, and you know, mind you, it's it's hard to keep up this like excitement level when you're 
teasing these phones and revealing so much about it literally months in advance. But I mean, if I mean, I was excited for this event. I'm excited to have the hardware. Um, I don't think that I'm very disappointed along the way. And I, I think a lot of the feedback I saw online was in the you know similar camp. So I'd give them let's let's say like an A minus. I'm sure I'm sure there okay. are ways that they could have improved. But um, I thought they did a re really great job. And I thought the live stream was done really well, too. Like it wasn't you know, it didn't drag. It wasn't overly cheesy at, at moments like it, it was it was a, it was a good view. So that's nice. where I'm at. What do you all think? All right. Duncan, what do you think? Um, I found that the leaks didn't detract at all for me. Um, in previous mm -hmm. years, they may have. And I think what that says is on its own, this phone stands up officially out and, you know, there being no surprises. It didn't need any. It doesn't need one more thing. It didn't need to be a big surprise. Every incremental step of this device adds up to something that is better than what we've had before. It's the best pixel they've ever made. Um, and it doesn't even have any aluminium. Um, but <laughs> I really think that it's a strong device and that um, it didn't need the big reveal to stand on its own two feet. And I think that's been shown out by the number of people who tried to order it. It's been shown out locally in Australia where the um, device officially comes out on the 28th of October and shipping um, arrival dates now are pushing back. Um, you know, I think at one retailer we were checking out just before, it's 15th of November. So, you know, they're already clearing their first couple of weeks of expected inventory on, on certain sizes, models and colours. So, um, I think it was a, a really good launch. Um, if you gave us, you know, an A, B, C, D, E, F, I'll give it an eight and a half out of 10, just so we have different scales so they can't be- There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very important. Um, yeah. And, you know, Ron, you'll have to use one to five or something, but yeah, it, it's yeah, a really I'll solid use, launch. I'll use, I'll use stars. I'll give it, I'll, I'm going to give it a four star rating um, <laughs> with a ding <laughs> only because I lost the bet and there was no foldable, so- <laughs> <laughs> I think that's taking well, your frustrations out on the wrong place, Ron. Hey, I, I, hey, listen. I know Google. I know Google worked with us on this. I know we were in collaboration mode. It was great, but I would have liked one more thing. So. <laughs> well, you're gonna have to wait for that one more thing until Google actually releases the next version of of Android, the point version that supports yeah. whatever foldable it's about to release at some point in the hopefully yeah. in the near future. Uh, we don't actually know what Google's going to do in the future, so don't Who quote knows? us on that. We'll see. Well, we we can hold out hope. All right, coming uh, up next. Oh, sorry. What's up? I was going to say, I'm as excited about the Pixel 6 launch as I was about the Pixel 1. It has that feel yeah. for me. Wow. Uh, it, yeah. It's it, it almost feels new beginnings. i got to get in there and, and use it and be able to talk about it. But that's that's where I'm at. It almost feels like this is the first time Google brought a phone out and maybe they've just sucked me into their marketing with their chip and Google inside and the first true phone from Google. But um, if they have, it worked. Yeah. Right. Yeah, indeed. There cool. All right. Up next, we're going to check out a few of your emails. Well, a couple of emails and a video mail. All right. Can't wait. And I feel like the emails um, really should be renamed, Jason, to like, Talking about tablets and Chromebooks because I feel like that's yeah, what's this really is the topic that keeps going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just a quick reminder: you can email us at AAA at twit.tv, um, or you can call three four seven to show AAA and leave a message. So it's always good. does anybody do that anymore? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, yeah, but email us. Wow. Yeah, it's good. Good to hear from you, and it's good to hear from David, who writes in and says, "I heard your recent response to an email about the HP X211 Chromebook and how, for the price, it's just too expensive. I agree with the sentiment. With this sentiment, if you purchase it at MSRP, however, it has very recently been on sale quite a few times at Best Buy for three hundred eighty to four hundred dollars. At this price, it's no question the better choice versus the Lenovo Duet." Remember, the X2 comes with a keyboard folio attachment, USI st stylus, more premium build, and fingerprint reader, along with a higher resolution uh, th uh, 3 to 2 ratio screen. Its magnets used for attaching the stand hinge, keyboard stylus, and holding the keyboard flap closed are also on a completely other level. You definitely aren't afraid of any of those pieces ever accidentally getting bumped off. I speak from this from experience as I took advantage of one of these recent Best Buy sales to procure one. While I love my duet, I think I found a worthy upgrade slash side grade. 
Love the show, and I can't wait to hear what you guys think about the upcoming Pixel event. David, we hope you enjoy the show. Um, thank you for chiming in uh, and 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 giving the glowing kind of recommendation of the HP X2 11 Chromebook. Those are all valid points. Um, even with a sale price of three hundred eighty to four hundred dollars, that's still kind of expensive, um, and it depends on where your situation is and what you're looking for. You know, versus the lower price duet versus you know versus this. But it's it's a compelling it's a compelling case you make, um, and I'm glad that you found the device that works for you, um, which is pretty cool. So always happy to hear that people find the device that works for them. Yeah. That's the Me point. Too. Me too. I'll- all different kinds of hardware out there. Nothing's going to work for everyone. Somebody is, has been watching and listening to this show going, how could you guys be saying all this good stuff about the Pixel 6 and the 6 Pro? It's horrible. Yes, people will think that and other people will love it. So that's just the way it works. So thank you for writing in. Uh, Charlie wrote in to say, I am contemplating a Duo 2. I use the Nova launcher on my slab and I'm not big on change, so I wrote to Nova to see how the launcher would work in the Duo 2. Their answer, in short, was not well. and <laughs> added that they won't be spending money and development time to make their software uh, dual folding screen device capable until they become mainstream devices. It's catch-22. Developers aren't going to develop software for dual-slash-foldable screen devices until most purchases come from that form factor, and most users are not going to adopt dual-slash-folding screen devices until there is software out there that supports them. Google, Microsoft, Samsung, and anyone else who is or is planning to manufacture these devices or provide the OS for them needs to get behind the software developers or dual screen slash foldables will be a flash in the pan. Might be part of the reason why this news, you know, about Google releasing a point release of Android 12, you know, that might actually be kind of part part of the importance around um, further legitimizing the foldable, um, you know, uh, the foldable approach. Um, Duncan, I know you have, you mentioned in, uh, before the show that you have the Z Fold 3, and I thought this might be a good opportunity to kind of talk about, you know, from, from your perspective, like, what do you think about this email from your perspective of the Z Fold 3? Because it sounds like, you're pretty positive on this device. I, I played around with both of them and I definitely sided more with the Z Flip 3 than the Z Fold 3, but you're pro Z Fold. So what do you think? And especially as as relates to what Charlie wrote in to say. So Charlie, I hear what you're saying. I have the Z Fold 3 running Nova on top of it. Um, and the issue I have is when it's in single screen mode, you've got the normal launcher UI. When you open it up, you've got these huge bands of space between each of your apps. And it doesn't have the ability to have two different home screens. The native launcher does allow you customization between those two. And I think in the interim, we are going to have to rely on that native launcher experience for the foldable, foldables until there's enough in the market. It comes back almost to the uh, conversation we had about setting up the Pixel not using Nova. It is how I Android. Uh, we actually have a section on Osdroid called How I Android. And you know, a big part of mine was about Nova. Um, I use so many power features. I've got um, a double dock. I use swipe up on icons. I use the gestures. Like it, it, it is 60% of how I use Android, I found out when I stopped using it. So I understand the not wanting to lose something that is so ingrained in your Android experience. And that's what it makes Android so great is we can even do that. But it, the chicken and egg, I think, is completely correct. But I'm not sure that you know, um, Google's going to reach out and pay a developer to get that over the line. What they'll do is try to make their launcher the best. Samsung will try and make their launcher the best. And then when we have those templates that work, that's when people like Action Launcher or Nova Launcher can, can jump on board. It would be great if they could afford to lead the pack, but I can understand why they don't. So I completely hear what you're saying. Um, I have chosen to live with a ridiculous home screen inside my device and keep Nova rather than going to the, the, the launcher from the vendor. But but on the folding device, I, I really do love it. The reason I like the flip is for me, the fold. Sorry, is for me it's replacing a work phone and a work tablet. And in ninety nine percent of occasions now, that that screen is big enough to do the tablety things that I would do at meetings. Um, and the few times it's not, I probably want a laptop anyway. 
Um, and so I'm using it from a real productivity perspective. I've even tried using it with, with Dex um, and plugging it in. And if it wasn't for the fact that I work with incredibly complicated Excel spreadsheets with macros I've written, um, I would have continued that experience because from a normal productivity perspective, it worked really well. So I, I do agree with Ron that there is something in this category. And you know this, this year iteration may be the first time they're close to getting it right. Uh, and I was saying pre-show that for me, what I actually think I want is the pull-out device. And so that you've got a small device that grows and it would be great if you could add just a little bit, a little bit all the way up to the top. But, you know, getting back to your email, I, I hear your pain, but I think foldables need to make it before third parties join, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully we're working there. Uh, I'm sure Ron feels like, you know, hopes that uh, that we're working there. I sure do. It all work out. <laughs> I, I sure and I do. do. Let me, yeah. yeah. Let me tell you, I I want to live in a foldable future. Duncan and I were talking before the show started um, when we were talking about the foldables and we we're talking about the you know the the. The, the we we're at that we're almost at the tipping point for foldables i think we're like one generation away from becoming you know kind of very mainstream um and but part of it will to charlie's point is the software and that's that's the point of it all right so it's gotta it's yeah. gotta work so yeah foldables aren't hall of fame worthy yet not yet no not yet. Someday, but when maybe. but when when one break breaks through, man, we are going to celebrate, Duncan. We are going to party, and it is going to be awesome. So when we get the Nexus I, Five of foldables, so <laughs> I predict a retrospective uh, entry. And, you know, I'll, I'll put a flag on the on the ground that when we get to the point where a foldable makes it to the Hall of Fame, in retrospect, we will look back, or you will look back, and you will see the device that was the turning point. And it'll get an honorary um, entry. We just don't know right. what that turning turning point device is yet. We so can't get a retroactive that. kind of spot. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to know I mean, when I, you're in the eye of the the storm, right? You just I, I look fo I look forward to the day. That's for sure. So. <laughs> All right, um, and now it is time for, and this one really deserves it, everyone. The email of the week. Uh, and to, to, to tell you exactly Jason's notes from our document, uh, yes, this is a long video, but it is good. Um, <laughs> so I'll read the email quickly and then we'll go into the video. Um, well, the, Adam, the, the email is actually a follow up. Oh. The, the email is, is kind of okay. after. Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry, so let's, let, let's just, let's just go to the, we're going to do the email of the week was a video that was sent to us by someone by the name of Adam. He is the recipient of the email of the week, uh, with this. Thank you, Burke, uh, with this video submission. So sit back, enjoy. If you're audio listeners, listen to what Adam has to say. If you're watching on video, check this out. It's long, but it's good. Uh, roll tape. Hey, Triple A crew. This is Adam. I just wanted to follow up from your most recent episode uh, where you talked about messaging issues and RCS and Apple and iMessage, of course, and all the challenges around that. I want to send not a video, but a quick screen recording uh, just to quickly talk about. I know you've talked about Beeper in the past. Uh, it got me thinking about how much I love Beeper. I'm a Beeper user, and I wanted to just show it really quickly um, so you can see exactly how it is in practice if you haven't seen it. Uh, so you can see right here, there's the Beeper app. Uh, for those uninitiated, uh, Beeper is essentially a messaging integration. It's a one-stop shopping. So I have all of my messages uh, in one place. So all of my SMS come in there, my WhatsApps, my iMessages, Instagram messages. Um, but it also can do Telegram and Signal, Slack, Discord, IRC, Hangouts. Um, so it's really great for integrating pretty much every messaging service people use. I don't use them all, uh, but I use a, a few of them. And I got it primarily so I could talk with all of my iPhone friends using iMessage. Uh, so if I open up the Beeper app, uh, you can see here the integration. Uh, at the top, there's Inbox, uh, Classic, and Spaces. Uh, so basically, Inbox is a timeline um, uh, of most uh, recent messages. Classic is just pure timeline, regardless of whether you read them or not. And then Spaces will actually show you all of the different integrations you have, and you can go directly to them. Uh, so you can see here in my Inbox, what I have here is the icon will show you how that message came through. So that's a WhatsApp. Uh, there's a iMessage, there's an Instagram message, there's a Beeper message from my Beeper support engineer that I work with. Um, there is a Instagram uh, message that came in and you can see if I scroll down enough, I think you'll see an SMS. So there's a SMS that came in. 
and that's pretty much how it integrates. Uh, and then if I go to spaces and I tap, for example, on iMessage, these are all the iPhone users that I can iMessage with. And so if I open up one of these conversations, cool. uh, you can see that they actually, I'm gonna send a quick test, test message here. Um, you can see the reactions come in as actual reactions instead of as text message um, SMS users on Android know when you get these reactions from iPhone users, it usually says, quote unquote, laughed at, and then it repeats your message. Um, there you go. You can see the message I just got right there as a test message. I got my little, little thumbs down. So that's how it works. Uh, it's super great because I don't have to deal with the back and forth SMS um, with the iMessaging um, or spending sending messages to iPhone users. Uh, I actually can pretend like I have real iMessage, and in effect, I do. So I absolutely love it. Uh, Beeper's great. It's 10 bucks a month. I paid 100 bucks for the year, uh, and they're pushing out updates all the time. So I just wanted to give a little shout out to, to Beeper because it's pretty great. Um, integration app in general, but uh, awesome if you want to have real iMessage conversations with all of your Apple friends and family. Uh, thanks. Love the show. Nice. So thank you, Adam. That is a great video. And we did talk about Beeper a few months ago. We're immensely curious about it. We really do like it as well. Um, Adam also followed up uh, and he wrote, I'm basically running a Beeper server bridge on my iMac at home where I'm logged in with my Apple ID. So I'm actually using my own iMessage account, but my Mac is processing all the messages and sending them to and from the Beeper app on my Samsung Z Flip 3. Beeper is building up a server farm that will allow them to, to ultimately host all users so you wouldn't need a Mac device to run the bridge but for now it works perfectly fine um and i think it's really cool i think that the, the interface i had actually seen it in in function there with the app and i think the interface is really cool it's it's delivering on the dream um i don't know if it's worth 10 bucks a month and like I, mean, I say that as I say that as someone yeah. who's paying a ridiculous amount for YouTube TV and for like a million different monthly kind of things and, and that sort of thing. And like 10 bucks a month, I can I can absorb that cost. But like for some reason, that's my like I, I've been like hovering over doing it. I'm like, ah, I don't know, 10 bucks a month. That's a lot. Yeah. So 10, 10 <laughs> does feel like a lot. But I mean, I mean, yeah. I guess if a lot of what you need is simplification of messaging or you're just communicating with a lot of people on iPhones and you know that that yeah. could be the reason as well. I could totally see how 10 bucks a month like I feel also for myself that 10 bucks a month is too much, but I could totally see that for some people that's that price is totally fine considering what you get here. I mean uh, I will say I, I, yeah, I will say like the the using iMessage and like seeing the reaction and stuff like that, that's fine. That's built for me. It's the unification and just using one app for all different platforms like that. Yeah. That is, you know, like it, it, it's, it's the, uh, what was, what do we all used to use back in the day? Trillium. Trillium. Yeah. Yep. Trillium, uh, yep. Trillium yeah. Or pigeon or like, or, yeah. or like there's a whole, like whatever, you know, like, Oh, I can put my Google chat and my hotmail chat and my, and AOL and all this stuff into one thing. And it was, that, that was great. Um, so if like, I can it's, ask, it's, yeah. yeah. If I can ask you about what what would you pay to roll back platform lock in and you know the capitalistic greed that has has led to the destruction well, of messaging in 2021. I mean a, a what, lot. What is and that if you, if you, price? Yeah, if you if you if you watch the show, you hear that it is quite like a hot button of mine. If you if you watch or listen, it's something I rant about. But apparently, I've hit my limit. I don't know. I I don't know what it is. So I mean. We all believe in support your devs. You say that more than yep. any of us, Ron. Sure, um, I do. What is what is that monthly figure? Because I'm not criticizing that $10 is the wrong figure for you. I'm just sort of, yeah. let's give some real-time feedback to a developer who's done something that every one of us has ranted about. What What uh, is that uh, monthly figure? 100%. $4.99, I'm in. $4.99 a month, 5 bucks a month, I'm in. There you go, Beeper developer. Uh, I don't know your <laughs> monthly server costs, but there's some real-time feedback from the biggest yeah. evangelist I know for centralized messaging. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, and that's the thing. Like, five bucks, it would be a no brainer. Four ninety nine, it would be a no brainer. For some reason, that ten just sticks at me, sticks in my craw. I don't know why. And I want, and I want unified messaging. I want this. I really should. I really should put my money where my mouth is, shouldn't I, Duncan? You have a point. I, I'm not attempting to guilt you. I, I'm. I'm actually very interested because I, for years, 
have have listened and spoken with you and heard you talk on this topic, and yeah. I I know you truly mean it. So I think what it says is for for an engaged user like yourself. Now maybe in your world you've got a workaround that works for you, yeah. and so this isn't the right price. I mean, my workaround is simple. If you don't text me or Telegram me, you don't talk to me. Because I just, yeah. Cad Blanc refused to be on any of the other platforms. And if we can't talk, I'm okay with that deal. I'm also, you know, you know, somewhat aspergacy and uh, that, that works just out fine for me. Uh, but, you know, maybe it's the wrong price point for someone with the uh, the friction you're feeling. For other people, the friction may be greater and, and therefore it's worth it. Yeah. Would yeah. you pay no, less mean- money for less services? Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Like going back to the, the YouTube TV complaint, like I would, I wish I could pay a la carte. Like looking at looking on the Beeper website, right? I, I was on it right now, um, and all the services it offers. You know, WhatsApp, yes, I use Facebook Messenger, yes, iMessage, yes, Android Messages, SMS, yes, Telegram, I'm on Twitter, yes, Slack. I don't use Google Hangouts. I don't use Google Chat. Instagram, yes. No Skype, no IRC, no Matrix, I guess Discord, Nine, no Signal, no LinkedIn, no Beeper Network. Soon will be Line, GroupMe, MS Teens, WeChat, and Kako. Um, so that's nine services that I use out of their list, wow. yeah. which is a lot. But the thing is, is. is that like I, I also like – I want unified messaging for SMS and iMessage. I don't necessarily want it for Slack and for – Discord, yes, Facebook Messenger, maybe WhatsApp. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Like, I like uh, having Slack in Slack. Like, that's the, yeah. yeah that's I a- was going to make that same point. For me, yeah. Discord is where um, Club Twit lives and a couple of other groups that I'm involved with, but mainly it's Club Twit. And I go there when I want to engage with that community and read yeah. that content. Um, and then I've got Slack, which is where a lot of my beta communities are. And I go there for that purpose. Um, yeah. So I agree with you. A, a unified messaging platform for me would be platforms where I want to invite people to contact me when I'm not choosing to engage with them. And for me, I just use SMS and Telegram. But I know a lot of other people might use Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, um, you know, Signal. So they're the core services that I would see people wanting to bring in. Um, I, you know, because you don't want everything coming in as a tidal wave. Yeah, no, and, and I will add to that, that my latest gripe about messaging is less about the lack of uniformity across cross-platform, but for me, at least it, you know, what has rendered SMS completely useless is two-factor authentication and marketing texts. Like I, I scroll through my, like the number of messages I've missed from friends that have come that have come through because I see a sea of, you know, you know, hey, it's your, you know, here's a sale for, here's a Ben Sherman sale or confirming your appointment tomorrow or your one time code or, you know, like notifications of my electric bill being paid or my monthly T Mobile bill. Like, I, I, if I had a, if there was a Gmail like classification system for text messages that you could label and then filter out and just show, you know, like, but r- right now it's filled with so much spam, it's like, it's almost useless. So, hmm. Yeah, it, it's yeah. that value add layer on top of aggregation because yeah. my my wife will communicate with me on several different platforms and I have to move between them. So I would love the ability to have everything come into one stream and then choose to always communicate back on one. Um, right. And that way I could I could get this aggregation of thoughts across three different platforms, get that timeline of the different thoughts that were happening and then reply to whatever I wanted to reply to. Um, and I could sort of see value in, in the next phase of this. So I guess what we're saying is to the poor beeper guy who's done a ton of work or team, um, you, you know, um, now just add a whole pile of AI and contextual information on top of your open source product. That'd be great. Yeah. Actually, if, if Google could come in and buy beeper and then offer this as another service in Plex, in, uh, sorry, in the, what was it? The uh, Play Pass. Yep. Then, you know, full. Are you that suggesting in there. Google needs a fifty-third messaging service? Is this <laughs> yeah. what I just this, heard? But this would be the right messaging service because it would combine them all into a nice package. W- and Jason, <laughs> so that's by the, the way, your, your your slip of the tongue, by the way, reminded me that I do pay for Plex Pass. Um, okay. And it is four ninety nine a month. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you yeah. know. I, 
if I had to look at the, what Beeper offers and, and come up with a figure, mine wouldn't be quite four ninety nine. Mine would probably be seven ninety nine. I don't, and I don't know at that point if it makes a whole lot of difference, eight dollars to ten dollars a month. But, but yeah. I do think what they're doing. I mean, it's a pretty slick presentation of and and a pretty good solution for something that, like you said, Duncan, we complain about a lot. You know, I don't know. You also have to have a Mac running though, and at least at this stage. That's, you know, that's a lot to, to ask, at least in my situation. I, there isn't a Mac computer that I have running 24 uh, hours a day. I do. I've got this. I've got this Mac mini running right here in front of my desk. That's all. It's powering my Plex, powering my music and that sort of thing. And they powered totally, on all the time. I could, yeah. you know, all right. So Duncan, you might have, you might have guilted me into this. I might, I might, I might put my money where my mouth is. And so maybe we'll get my, uh, and, and of course, Adam as well with your, with your very long, but good video, uh, may have nudged me in the direction of checking it out so i can always cancel it <laughs> right so, there. there it is and that's email of the week. Oh. Email of the week. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Appreciate that uh, for sending in that video and creating a very compelling conversation afterwards, if I do say so myself. Uh, we have reached the end of a pretty compelling episode of All About Pixel. Thank you so much for watching and listening. And big thanks to you, Duncan, for carving out, let's let's be honest, a little bit more time than I, than I asked you for. So thank you for sacrificing your time today it's always a pleasure a time with friends is never time sacrificed thank you so much for having me go. on I, I love i love joining when i can um for those yeah. who want to follow what we do at osdroid you can get us at osdroid.net and uh, you can follow me on the twitters down below i'm not that um that, that prolific but i do lurk a lot and uh, all i can say is everyone needs to uh, watch out for when we can finally talk about pixel devices on all about pixel there's nothing to see here move along there's nothing to see here <laughs> this is not the pixel you're seeing <laughs> no I, no there are definitely not pixels in front of your face right now definitely not well actually uh, everyone is looking at a lot of pixels they're just not seeing any pixels any pixel sixes <laughs> Uh, thank you again, sizzles. Duncan. Always, always a pleasure hanging out with you, and especially on a day like today. It was perfect having you on today. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. And what about you, Ron? Uh, it's always perfect having you on. What do you want to talk about? What do you want people to know? I don't know, I don't know if it's perfect. Slightly flawed, maybe at best. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, just follow me over at Twitter and Instagram at RonXO and check out Scorbit in the Google Play Store if you're in pinball. Keep track of your pinball scores. Go to Scorbit.io to get all the info. Uh, things are going really, really, really well over at Scorbit. We're having fun. So that's the whole point of pinball. So Yeah, yeah no kidding. Pinball yeah. shouldn't be work. It should be fun. No, it should be fun. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, Ron. And huge thank you to Burke, who has been sweating bullets for the last three hours uh, getting this show to happen. So thank you, Burke, for making it happen. <laughs> the sound of bullets being sweated? I don't know. Uh, thank you to Victor behind the scenes, who has some edits to do, but really appreciate all of your hard work uh, each and every week uh, getting this show out to people. Um, you can just find me on Twitter at Jason Howell. On Tech News Weekly, uh, every Thursday, twit.tv slash TNW. Filling in for Leo when he's gone uh, next week and the week after on This Week in Google and Security Now. So you'll see more of me on the network over the coming weeks. Um, don't forget Club Twit. Uh, I'll make it really quick. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. All shows ad-free. Twit Plus podcast feed. Members only Discord channel. Total awesomeness. Seven bucks a month. Even Duncan is part of the club. Apparently, and I, I need to talk to you after the show and make sure and, and set your status to contributor because you are a contributor to the network. So we need to For sure. bump you up there. Um, and then my big request is the best of the year end best of twit.tv slash best of. If you have any moments, and I'm talking like any moments that stand out that you're like, oh, that was pretty funny when this happened. I think it was this episode or whatever. Twit.tv slash best of. It makes my job a lot easier because I got to come up with some moments and I keep putting it off and I need to do it. I've got like a couple of weeks left to get my preliminary list of moments together on all of the shows. So 
twit.tv slash best of, and you can help a producer out. Really appreciate it. That is it for this week's episode of All About Pixel. We appreciate you immensely. We do this show every Tuesday, although it's not usually all about Pixel. It's usually all about Android. So every Tuesday evening, twit.tv slash AAA, that's important, and uh, you can subscribe there, and we hope that you do. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time on All About Pixel, Android, whatever. Bye, everybody. So long. See you, everyone. If you find yourself talking to those virtual assistants in your house quite often, or maybe you can make your light turn on and off with the touch of a button, well, Smart Tech Today is the show for you. Join Matthew Casanelli and myself, Micah Sargent, every week as we talk all about smart stuff and the fun that comes along with it. 